Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. John Turner, Nigel Thurlow, welcome to the Exagility Podcast. How are you doing today? Doing well, thanks, John. Great to be here again. I've got a very heavy book here on my desk. It's the Flow System Playbook by John R. Turner, PhD, and Nigel Thurlow. And I'd like to uh, walk through the book with you today and delighted to have you here on the program. Thank you so much for coming. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. I wanted to start with the uh, who this book is in memory for. And I was really struck by the four people that you had this book in memory for. So there was uh, Rizzo Shingo, who died in 2023. And uh, he, was a, he was a toy leader, master sensei, and an inspiration and personal friend to Nigel. And then there was uh, Masaki Imai, who also died last year, the father of the Continuous Improvement and Kaizen. And then we had Norman Bodek, who died uh, four years ago, the man who gave you the library that you all have studied and learned from, also a friend. And Bobby Rivera, is that right, Rivera? R- Rivera, Rivera. Uh, Rivera, uh, who died uh, last year as well, 2023. Loving mother to our friend and flow system creator, Brian Punch. Rivera. So, can you tell us um, why why you focus on these? If we start with Shingo, um, tell us a little bit more about Shingo. Sure. I felt at the time we 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 will as we started to look, we're starting to lose a lot of the great senseis, a lot of the great teachers that have helped us develop who we are. Certainly a lot of inspiration for me. Shingo-san was the son of a much more famous guy called Shigeo Shingo, who worked with Daichi Ono in developing a lot of the techniques behind the Toyota production system. So techniques like SMED, single minutes exchange of dye, to, to uh, quote one of the common ones. But then Shingo-san's son, Ritsu Shingo, who's, who's uh, dedicated in the book, he went on to work for Toyota for 40 years. Worked for Akio Toyota and many of the other greats in, in Toyota and knew actually Akio's many other family members. I got to know him some years ago, coincidentally, because of the work of Norman Bodek and some trips I took where I met Shingo-san, and he became a close friend and uh, a mentor, teaching us a lot of the things that had been taught and learned over the decades in Toyota. He himself wrote a small book, but his his father wrote several books that we would never have had access to if it wasn't for people like Norman Bodek. So the connection between Bodek and Shingo is very close, and I was fortunate enough to spend many trips and and many times with Shingo-san. He actually stayed at my house a few times. And if it wasn't for people like that, we wouldn't have the knowledge we have now. And just to mention Norman, because I've mentioned Norman Bodek now a couple of times, he was responsible for PC Press, the company that published all the books that everybody's learned from over the years. He brought Ono's work, Shingo's work, many other master works of knowledge to the libraries of all lean practitioners. So that was the connection between them. And then Imai was mentioned because he was the person who really wrote about Kaiser at, at scale, not Kaizen at scale, but wrote a lot of publications at scale about Kaizen and publicized and made Kaizen very well known across the world. And then, of course, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Ponch's mother, Bobby Rivera, she passed away and uh, Ponch is our uh, third co-creator of the Flow System and co-author of the first book. John, do you have any reflections on that as well, on, on the memories there? No, no, Nigel covered it all, and he he knew the senseis. I I didn't I didn't know them personally, but uh, Brian was our good uh, colleague with the flow system, so we wanted to make sure we put that in there for for his mother. Good stuff. I'm delighted you did that. Uh, let's get started with the book, and uh, I'm going to page two in the book, which is about clarifying the problem. I so often see and hear thought leaders talking about uh, here's my thing whatever your problem is this is the solution <laughs> but I was delighted to see that he started like literally uh, and then one of the first pages on clarifying the problem can you tell us a little bit more about that and what your thinking was behind that I mean I can start John if you want and then because 
my colleague John Turner has written a lot about ill-defined problems and what tends to happen I mean my background is Toyota a lot of people are aware of that and the first step on an A3 problem solving paper TBP Toyota business practices is known as in Toyota is to clarify the problem if we don't first clarify the problem then we start actually looking for causes and then root causes of the wrong problem and one of the first things I ever say to executives when I go in to an organization is what do you think the problem is you're trying to solve because then they'll usually say things like you know customer or employee attrition costs are too high profits are too low whatever some some notion of that and I sort of explained to them that they're actually not problems, they're outcomes of how you do what you do. And so it's so important to actually understand what is the problem you're trying to solve. Because if you don't have that first, then you start applying frameworks and tools and methods and techniques to a synthetic problem or a problem that you believe is the problem. But if it's not the right problem, you exhaust a ton of energy. I'll hand over to John Turner because he wrote quite a bit about ill-defined problems. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so one, one of the things we want to get at is not all problems are the same, and there are different methods or techniques used for different types of problems. You can't just use one technique for any type of problem. And that's where the Kinevin framework really comes in handy is because you have your clear or complicated side or you have comp complex problems. So for one of the first things to look at when you're looking at trying to address a problem, trying to define the problem, is it a complicated problem or is it a complex problem? Because the methods and techniques you use for complicated problems are going to be different than those you use in complex problems. And so this book, the Flow System Playbook, primarily, not completely, but primarily focuses on methods, techniques, and tools for the complex domain for complex problems. And so that's, that's one of the things we're really trying to get at. And then we also challenge the traditional reductionistic methods. So here's the problem. Let's break it down to smaller sub-problems and let's start addressing these small sub-problems to get to the end and it resolve the, the issue or the problem. And that's a reductionistic method. And that works fine in the comp complicated domain. But in the complex domain, there's too many unknown variables that you can't break the problem down to sub-problems. So now you have to use a different approach to, to start addressing and better learning about the complex problem because you, you can't break it down to sub-problems. So you can't use a reductionistic method. So that's one of the things that we, we challenge. Yeah, I'll talk about the need for clarity on our objectives. Uh, even if we end up finding out that our objectives are wrong, there's mirrors in trying to be clear about them because uh, whatever about being off target when you are not clear you're going to be um, you know it's going to be a you know, you're going to have a better chance when you when you think you're talking about the same thing <laughs> right i guess right that way yeah so, but i'm glad to hear you you're talking about complexity already and john actually uh while, while you're while you're on there i mean nigel mentioned his background with toyota he's got a fairly uh a big background in lean as well and um you kind of met in, in the locality, you got to know each other, and and tell us a little bit more, John, about, you know, how you, how yourself and Nigel started to work together, because you were working in the academic area, uh, Nigel working more in the kind of industrial side, and so how did you kind of play in each other's strengths to, so that you could work really well in a book like this, because it's, it's quite a big topic here, this, this whole book. Yeah. So... We both moved into the same area around Dallas, North North Texas, which is more north of Dallas, Fort Worth area. We're probably five minutes away by car from one another before we even met one another. I was I was at the university and Nigel was at Toyota Connected. Yeah. And my mother lived with us at a time and she was going to a um, retirement home at uh old folks home for activities just north of here and it was in the town closer to where Nigel was living at the time and his wife Jody would go there and do volunteer work and they also when they would go to leave town they look for someone to house sit while they're out of town so Jody went to the retirement home facility and requested to see if there was someone interested in house sitting while they were going out of town and my mother volunteered so she started house sitting for them when they went out of town, and then I just asked her who who this 
who these people were, and I wanted to just to get to know them just to make sure. They were he wa- Let me just say, he wanted right? to come and make sure that his mother was being looked after, and there wasn't any crazies at the end of the 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 the, the, the pet sitting and house sitting gig. Right. So when I met Nigel, we started talking, and we found out we we're kind of working in the same space with teams and complexity and in leadership, and so we just got to talking, and that then he invited me over to toward it connected so we worked there did some work evaluating their teams we got a publication and then we just from there we just kind of got into the flow system and that's rest is history that's where we're at now and i think it's fair to say for for john turner's point it was very difficult with these two johns on the call but uh when uh, uh john turner in his background was he did engineering as a career before he went into academia so he came from praxis into academia and what i and john's sort of relationships has enabled us to do is to look at academia look at synthesizing new theories then look at trying those out and testing them out in the real world and then reflecting back we'll get into empiricism later maybe that's a good conversation but then reflecting that back on the theories and then adapting and and evolving things that we think about and the playbook to a degree is a reflection of things we've used over the years in sort of understanding how to help organizations transition and evolve in ways of working if we go on to the Levels of Agility, page 9 in the book, I like the way you've distinguished business agility from product agility because a lot of people kind of conflate the two of those together. And you also have team agility and individual agility. And uh, can you tell us uh, what, what was the kind of driver for kind of uh, pointing that out in the book, actually? What was... Uh you know, it was came from my work a lot in the agile space and, and something you're very familiar with, John, as well. And I wanted people to understand that when we talked about organizational or business agility, it wasn't a matter of using Scrum or a particular framework to achieve some sort of outcome. While they may lend themselves and help themselves, uh, help organizations to become more agile and to enable agility, that wasn't the focus. And I wanted to help people understand that a business and organization has the what we call fitness we talk about system fitness which is its ability to survive and when we start to talk about resilience and robustness resilience is what we really mean is agility so we talk about organizations wanting to have or exhibit resilience they need to be resilient in other words when something happens that impacts them in one way or another, they can recover from that rapidly. And that's business agility. So I wanted to distinguish that because I wanted people to understand that from an organizational survival and organizational fitness perspective, they needed to be able to be very resilient and respond rapidly to things that happen. And Dave Snowden actually gives a great analogy of the difference between robustness and resilience. When you take something like a seawall, a sea defense, that's very robust. It's extremely strong, very robust and and, and impervious to attack until it fails. And when it fails, it fails catastrophically, which is not good for an organization. So we seek resilience, which is the ability for companies to take impacts, but then respond rapidly and adapt and evolve and change. And that's business agility. And I wanted to distinguish that from the normal conversations around agility, which is all about frameworks like Scrum and and other not so agile frameworks like Scaled Agile. But then I wanted to talk, uh, show that product agility Agility. If I'm a consumer and I'm using an iPhone or something similar, I'm seeking rapid responsiveness to my needs, wants, desires. So how quickly can we we change the product? Can the product pivot? Can it respond to the uh, consumer's needs, wants, and desires? Because unfortunately, value is perceived by the receiver, not by the giver. So as the recipient of value, it's my perception as to whether your product is valuable and you have to ensure you're responding rapidly to my needs, wants and desires to maintain that product's relevance. Because once the relevance is gone, the relevance for you or your product to continue to exist has also gone. So that's why I wanted to make product agility very clear as opposed to organizational agility. The two aren't aren't mutually exclusive, but, you know, we wanted to make sure there was a reference to that. And then simply on the uh, team and and individual, teams 
maybe doing Scrum, maybe using some other approach, need to be able to respond to the changing requirements of the organizations in which they work and in which they provide value. And at the same time, you as an individual need to be re able to change your approaches, your methods, your techniques, your behaviors to better support the team you're in. That was really the motivation behind those four definitions, John. Thank you, Nigel. And I'll, I'll stick with you for this next question as well, Nigel, because one of the things that you point out in the book is that value flows horizontally across silos, whether they're functional silos or product silos or picture silos, there's always silos of some sort. <laughs> but uh, the, the value flows horizontally. But what I have seen quite a lot is organizations, even three, four years after they've started with agility, they have coaches within each department uh, looking after agility within the department. The work is queuing up between one department and the next. They're not even making the phone calls to check, uh, you know, guys, have you got that thing ready for me? Uh, have, you, have we even told those other people that they're, uh, we're depending on them? And you know, these kind of silly things kind of start happening. But you drew attention to this in the book as well. Uh, do you have any tips for people and, and how people can actually get started with that? How, how do we get started with, uh, you know, um, even visualizing that, actually? Well, we'll probably get on to discussion about value streams later, but as a lean guy or as a Toyota guy who practices lean thinking, the first thing I want to do is understand where the customer is and how value flows to the customer. And of course, the word flow is now becoming the latest sort of adjective or noun to enter the lexicon of, you know, agile practitioners. But essentially, value flows to the customer because of a customer need, want or desire. The organization then should structure itself in a way to optimize that flow. But what tends to happen is you see in most organizations, we build islands of disconnected effort or towers of power. And these silos become these vertical structures which only focus on a piece of the puzzle, not the entire puzzle to deliver the value to the customer. So you ask me how we can improve that communication, communication, communication. I used to say that was the three C's of project management back in the day, and I don't think that has changed. Great program managers bridge silos and bring people together for conversations. And you cannot, you cannot achieve this without great communication, great collaboration, great cooperation, conflict resolution, and other things we call the nine C's that I'm sure Mr. Turner will talk about in due course. John, I was just going to ask you about that. What are these nine C's about? Tell us more. Oh, so nine C's. So when you're, when you're talking about teams, through the research over the years, it was like five C's, and then it went to six C's, and the current iteration is, is nine C's of teamwork. So teamwork consists of these C's, and they're broken down to the influence, influencing conditions and emergent processes. So the influencing conditions are composition, context, and culture. And that's those are the items that the team members really have little or no control over. So they're assigned to a team. The context is the, the work they're doing. So they, they don't have any really say over who else is going to be on the team for the in general for the most part so that's the influencing condition so the, the leader has more control over that but not really the team members the emergent processes consist of cooperation coordination conflict cognition communication and coaching and those are the items that team members have control over so if you're a leader and you're you're observing your teams you should should see evidence of the team members practicing good communication skills they should be cooperating they should be managing conflict so you should be able to see signs of these six c's as a leader when you're observing your team if not you need to identify where they're breaking down and then focus your training on that specific skill and so the the nine c's are really a good place to get started when you're looking at your teams to observe them to evaluate them or if they're new teams to begin your training and once you get beyond in, into more detail beyond these nine c's the the training moves from these basic teamwork skills to more specific skills for the task and context the team's working in so healthcare teams would have a different context and need different skills than a team in software development or a team in manufacturing that's a little more advanced level and teamwork skills but the initial foundation is built on these nine c's 
You know, I just want to add there because this is the other thing that's important for people to realize. Teamwork doesn't naturally occur. Just because you stick a bunch of people together and call them a team doesn't make them a team. And no, no amount of lauding the Tuckman model is going to help you suddenly magically become a team. You actually have to learn how to be a team. We need to coach and teach people how to communicate, how to collaborate, how to solve conflicts, how to be psychologically safe in an environment with each other. It's not, you don't just chuck them in a room and say, hey, you're a team be a great team because that isn't how it happens teams have to learn how to be a team yeah i totally agree and i kind of got some hints as well in in that section as well that you when you talk about context culture and composition about management's role in kind of helping to shape uh, the right setting as well where maybe teams could be more successful but absolutely teaming is a skill isn't it like uh pilots sit next to each other that they, they've learned over the years to how to get on with co-pilots and stuff like that and, and we kind of have to do something similar as well i think particularly when we're trying to resolve dependencies and all that kind of stuff yeah. it's really tricky but on, on page 38 we talk about the customer the customer is your centroid and i see so many teams that are so removed from the customer it's not funny it's like they think it's a great idea to have um business analysts as product owners. I mean, I, I don't have anything against business analysts, but I've only seen three important ones in my entire career. And um, so it's kind of, you get to, you kind of get this distance from the customer then and the kind of broken telephone kind of problem. What's your perspective on this and on the customer? You know, it, for me, it's always been something that was drilled into me for 20 years and especially working at Toyota, despite, you know, media to the contrary from time to time, the focus is always on the customer. The first tenant of lean thinking from the Toyota production system is customer first. It always has been from 1946 when it was originally declared by the first president of Toyota Motor Sales, a guy by the name of Kamaya Sam. And when I start to even talk to clients nowadays about customer and they start to struggle with things like goal definition in sprints, if they're using Scrum or something similar, then I start to tell them, well, what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve for a customer? If you were standing in a re one of your retail shops or your customer was in your office and they're asking you, what did you deliver this sprint? How would you articulate that to them? But once you become detached from the customer, it's like Dan Pink talks about being detached from from the purpose motive, suddenly the reason you're doing the work is no longer clear. And if teams and individuals in teams are detached from the reason they're doing the work, then bad stuff happens, you know, apathy or just stuff doesn't get done as we want it to get done or the wrong incentives are, are focused on to drive things that happen to be delivered be they manager or leader incentives because now we're starting to work for managers incentives or leadership incentives rather than the customer and the whole centroid thing came from steve denning he 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 sort of put that in his original book the age of agile and i took what i was allowed to take without breaching any sort of image copyrights and recreated the idea of that because if we remember back before the internet and social media we had this sort of idea that the companies were the center of the universe and we as the customers only were able to receive from the companies that which they decided to sell as all providers as a service and if we didn't like the service it was pretty much tough now what's happened is the customer has moved to the center of the universe and companies orbit the customer that's the idea of that it was sort of taken from the copernican revolution uh, idea or metaphor is when we suddenly realized the earth wasn't the center of the universe and that the, the, the planets didn't orbit the planet Earth. So then from that point of view, we now start to look at the customer as our centroid, our center of the universe, and everything we do is for the customer's benefit. And so when I talk about the flow of value and, and it's starting and ending with the customer, if you remove the customer for pretty much most organizations out there, even nonprofits, there's no reason for them to exist. So if we lose focus of the customer, we're losing focus of the reason for us to exist. And you see that manifest all the time with Tesla Cybertrucks going rusty and things of that nature um, to, to bring a topical point in of the news this week. But to me, the customer is the reason we exist. And understanding that and how we flow value in the most effective way to the customer is something that a lot of organizations miss and forget about in their 
desire to chase profits or greater revenues or greater market share, they forget about the customer, which is okay in the short term. But then in the long term, the sustainability, the resilience of that organization declines because they, they neglected the customer in the short term for gain. And now the customer has deserted them. And actually winning that customer back is much harder than the time it took to gain them in the first place. At the end of every chapter, there's like a little workbook, workbook section, which I believe is available as a free download. So it's kind of like you, you study the section, you read it. Like, uh, for example, I've been asked a question here. Customer, for, who's the customer? Uh, give a brief description of your workflow. and uh, What's the level of quality of the product or service that your company provides? And that's really uh, seminal questions that maybe a lot of people don't ask, actually. And uh, it, might, uh, it might lead people to think a little bit differently if they, if they did that. Well, if I jump on a little bit, uh, Toyota Way is mentioned quite a bit in the book, as you would expect, because Nigel is one of the authors, and that's kind of well documented elsewhere as well, but it's also documented in this book. But what I want to draw attention to is uh, kind, of touch, kind of touching on what Nigel talked about earlier about empiricism. There's three different types of reasoning that you talk about on page 70 of the book, uh, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, and abductive reasoning. Because there's a belief out there that people should, uh, I don't know, set up these hypotheses and uh, validate or invalidate the hypothesis, and then uh, it was true or it was false, and then this is what we learned or whatever. Or we can see things happening, so we think that's true. But the, uh, Nigel, you have a, you have quite a strong view on this. Uh, do you want to tell us more about it? <laughs> well, I was gonna gonna tell uh, my colleague John to talk about this. He's the professor, but I'll give you my opinion, and he can give you a, a scientific explanation, perhaps. But everybody's obsessed with empiricism, not probably due to the fact that you know scrums had such a big sort of footing in the agile community, and the whole focus around scrum is empiricism. But people have to understand what we mean by empiricism. So we go all the way back to Sir Francis Bacon, a Brit, bless him, in 1620, who sort of took the modern scientific method and the work of Galileo and then started talking about observations and started talking about what we know as empiricism, which is called inductive reasoning. And so that's when you, you don't have any facts. You have no data or facts that support a certain hypothesis but you observe something and through the observation you probably reach an inference and that needs to be tested so you've reached an inductive hypothesis based purely on observation that's true empiricism so true empirical scrum as an example would be starting with no idea of the outcome just just uh, some observations which would enable you to form a hypothesis which you would then test. Where deductive reasoning is where you've actually got facts, you've got data. Somebody's done something before you, there's some measurements or there's some facts that have been gathered through analysis which allow you to form a hypothesis. These are different types of ways of reaching a hypothesis. And then the, the new one which Dave Snowden talks around a lot, well, new, new to a lot of practitioners, is abductive reasoning which is the logic of the hunches. The guess, the gut feel. You come home, your dog's torn up a bunch of newspaper, a bunch of... You come home and you find a bunch of paper torn up in the house, the dog's been alone, your gut feel is the dog destroyed the papers. But then you've got a little bit of observation there. You can see the papers are torn up, but you didn't observe the dog doing it, so you can't have an inductive hypothesis that the dog did it. You have an abductive hypothesis, which is the gut feel again, needs to be tested. But we're constantly moving between all three of these all of the time when forming a hypothesis. Professor Turner, anything to add? Did I do okay? No, you did great. You did great. So one of the things you hear about with Snowden and people who are in a complex domain is you have to feel comfortable being uncomfortable, right? And if you look at all the higher education, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, you learn primarily about deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. And then so you have quantitative, qualitative methods and so forth. But very rarely do you really ever get into the abductive reasoning, reasoning side of things. And when you're really in complexity, you're working abductively, not deductively or inductively. So you, you really need to learn how to operate all three because you're going to go through all three phases 
and the one that's least known to most people is the adductive reasoning. And so, so we bring them all three together and explain what, what each are. Great, Neil. Thank you so much. Thank you, the two of you, for that explanation. I think that's uh, very helpful for people. I often wonder if people could come up with some uh, acronym or monomic or something so people find, would find these things easier to remember because uh, it's kind of a bit of a brain twister when people are thinking of, the, of these. Aid. <laughs> you have one? Aid, A-I-D. <laughs> yeah, <I'll do. laughs> Something to explain it, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some kind of, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll think of something. So you mentioned complexity uh, quite a bit. You're referring to Dave Snowden and uh, Conevan, the sense-making framework. And, uh, in fact, in the book, you talk about sense-making. And uh, I just wanted to kind of drill into that a little bit because a lot, lot, lot of time people kind of wave their hands talking about sense-making. But would you mind, gentlemen, giving you a kind of layperson's explanation? What the hell is sense-making? Well, for, I mean, Dave Snowden sums it up really well. It's making sense of the world we live in so we can act upon it, or something, and I'm paraphrasing it really badly. But quite often we can see behaviours or see outcomes or observe something, but we don't understand why. Sometimes we call about we call that dark constraints, where we actually see or observe something, but we don't actually know what's causing it. So what happens is we then need to do something to make sense of it, to understand it more deeply. So there are a range of techniques and a range of tools that enable us to make sense of things we do not understand. So at the very basic description, sense-making is the practice of understanding something we don't understand to make sense of it so we can act more effectively and probably choose the appropriate tools and techniques to use in being more effective in, I'm not going to use the word solutioning, but in fact looking at how we can act within a system to nudge the behaviors or the to nudge the outcomes that we want to so john do you want to add some more structure to that well it's like nigel said so you're you're and snowden calls it a make making sense of the world you live in right when things change as not expected why did they change what why did the outcome come out different than what you predicted right even though 10 times prior to that, the prediction was supported, but this time it's something's different, right? So a lot of inference making from what you observe. And so sense making has a lot to do with inference making, but it's, um, there's, uh, we did some ex extended research in this area and there's five theorists or researchers that pretty much solidified the, the field of sense making so snowden is one carl white russell durbin and klein so those are the five and so we really reviewed everything that their models and their their frameworks that they had related to sense making and kind of synthesized them into a, a common so your your sense and you're making meaning of of what you see or observe and then you're, you're sharing the information with other people, so it's more of a social activity, not just an individual activity. And then you have agency to make change, and then you evaluate that change. So it's all the way from sensing to really making the change and then evaluating that change. And so, so there's a long process involved with the sense making. It's not just sensing and trying to make sense yourself. It's, it's really trying to shift it and to make positive change and then evaluate that change so that make sure it's for the better. Just to give you the exact quotes from Dave Snowden, he says, a way in which we make sense of the world in order to act in it. And, and uh, Klein says, sense making is about making connections so that we can achieve a level of better understanding before acting. It's a way of avoiding assumptions or presumptions. It's a way of actually, and we'll get into re weak signal detection, I'm sure, but you start to see things, you start to observe things, and you need a deeper level of understanding before you act. Because what most of us do, and most organizations do, they, they see an effect, they presume cause, and they apply a solution. That's the ill-defined, it's coming back to clarify the problem.
So with sense making, it's enabling us to understand the landscape, the environment, the things that are impacting us, and make sense of it, truly understand it. I mean, you know, lean thinkers may talk about doing point of cause analysis, root cause analysis, and then defining countermeasures. Where when you're in a complex environment, those methods don't work because we're in an irreducible environment. We can't reduce it to a single root cause. So therefore, sense making, and when we start to explore narratives, which is one of the sense making techniques, it enables us to understand the environment, the situation more effectively, so we can design interventions, nudges which is we're, as opposed to countermeasures and solutions in an ordered system we're designing sort of nudges or small interventions to try and nudge the system in the right direction to try and change the behavior of the system and then through continuous sense making we're seeing whether those interventions those nudges are successful and that's the sort of subtle nuances between problem solving in the ordered world and problem solving or problem management if more correctly in a complex world give me an example of a nudge you so we, we may we may do some sense making we may observe some behaviors will narrative capture just for the audience's benefit is where people describe their experiences in short stories, short, short descriptive words. And through that, we may notice some behaviors that are patterns. We may notice some patterns of behavior. Some of them may be negative, some of them may be positive. So again, to quote Dave Snowden as a, an authority in complexity thinking, you know, more like this, less like that. So we may see some behaviors that are des desirable, some that are, are less desirable, undesirable. So we may, we may design a small experiment which we think which will nudge the system in a way of more desirable versus, you know, more undesirable. And so we, we design a small experiment. We say, if we do these things, maybe we'll get more of those desirable outcomes versus those undesirable outcomes. And then we run multiple parallel experiments. We, uh, and it's actually, I mean, if you, for the lean thinkers, set-based design is the same thing in the ordered world. It's many teams all trying to solve the same problem at the same time. So we run multiple parallel experiments and we sense, we, we observe, which of those are having some success and which are not. We're learning through that process. So back to your inductive, deductive, abductive reasoning, we're running multiple experiments. We're not 100% sure of the outcome, but through empirical observation, we can see what's being more successful and we'll do more like that, less like the others. And that's a nudge. A nudge is a small experiment, a small attempt to move the system in a certain direction, not this five-year plan with this gigantic change to shift everything because we know in a complex adaptive system that doesn't work and it's becoming apparent from the way you've described it this is why you have a triple helix right through the book so you've got the interwe interweaving of the the storytelling for example the, the complexity thinking as part of that the storytelling part of that narratives then you've got distributed leadership because in order for people to be able to run these parallel experiments they need to be safe to fail which means that people feel okay that they're not going to blame the blame the idea don't blame the person kind of thing you know what i mean and then you got the team science around that as well about you know how, how do people feel about trying different things so i'm guessing this is why you've got the three of them interlaced is, is that fair yeah i mean i'll add something and john can dig into a little bit deeper it's not when i started working on this with john a few years ago we realized that there were lots of fields of study lots of fields of research but they're all very siloed funnily enough we we're talking about silos earlier they were disconnected from each other and people focused on writing you know leadership novels or leadership books so there might be a little bit of work on team science it wasn't that well known and on the complexity side that was emergent other than what the agile community had spoken about and we realized these things first of all needed to be brought together because they were interdependent and they interacted with each other. And if people are confused about what a complex adaptive system is, look in the mirror and what's staring back at you is a complex adaptive system. And so once you introduce people into a system, it becomes complex just because of the ways we have, you know, this thing called free will and many other things that influence our behaviors and our actions. So suddenly we've got people. 
Well, then people fit into teams. And now we've got the team science. And we talked a little bit about the fact that people don't automatically become teams. They have to be trained to become teams. But then there's certain things within teams like leaders and leadership as a characteristic that emerges. And then things like psychological safety, which is something you can create an environment for. You can't tell somebody they're psychologically safe. You can only create the conditions and the environment for it. So that fits more into leadership theories and leadership work. And then, of course, we've talked a lot about complexity already. These things aren't separate and distinct. They're interconnected, interdependent, intertwined, which is what the triple helix is trying to visualize. John, did I do all right? I keep asking my professor here. I'm on a lifelong PhD, by the way, just so everybody knows. So, <laughs> Professor Turner. No, that's, that's good. One of the things we look at is if you're working towards complex issue or problem, you can't resolve the problem just by working in a team. And you can't resolve the problem if you're a leader. You can't just command, solve this problem, and give it to one team or two teams and just have them go at it using traditional methods. Complexity requires, like Nigel talked about earlier, multiple teams working in parallel to solve the same problem and then regrouping, synthesizing, learning what, what did we learn about the environment and then where to, what's the best next move and then do some more rapid parallels. So complexity requires diverse teams and in order for teams to work in parallel in a safe environment like you're talking safe to fail, that requires leadership to provide that environment for them to work safe to fail and to try these experiments and find out what works and what doesn't work and not be criticized or penalized for failing on, a, on an experiment because it's more exploratory at that stage. So all three of those have to be interconnected and come together in order to achieve a state of flow. And that's, that's the concept behind the triple helix of flow. Flow is achieved through the inter, inter, integration of the three helixes of this complexity thinking, distributed leadership, and team science. And that's kind of how we, we describe it. A lovely segue for my next uh, question because... Uh, page 175, there's a sentence that's a, it kind of gives, it kind of gives people a bit of a double take, I think. So I'll read it slowly. It says, a bottleneck is a type of constraint, but a constraint is not always a bottleneck. It's like, ah. Uh? You know, <laughs> I, 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 we put that in on, I mean, look. The theory of constraints is a really big topic. There are some great practitioners out there. I disagree with some of Goldratt's foundational thinking that flow is all about money. As a lean thinker, we talk a lot more about value. Um, but putting that sort of small distinction aside, the word throughput in lean means how much stuff can we make in a, a given amount of time, where throughput tends to mean how much money can we make in a given amount of time within the theory of constraints. And I can already hear them throwing things at the, the however they're listening to this and screaming at me, but the theory of constraints predominantly looks for constraints in work resources. Although I've, I've read stuff in the last few days that some of the key practitioners out there are now talking about constraints beyond that. Yeah, so a right. bottleneck is a type of constraint. It's a limitation of resources. You've reached the capacity of your humans or your machines or your processes to do more work in a given time, which is where lean people would talk about throughput, units per unit time. But a constraint is anything that impacts the performance of the organization. There's a definition in the book that came from the cited literature, but essentially there are many things in the wrong act, legal, regulatory, some things we can't do anything about, but they're constraints. Leaders, managers, attitudes, behaviors, their constraints, financial budgets, human resources, their constraints. Some of those constraints we can do something about. Some of them are inhibiting, which prevent their rules that stop us from doing things. Others are enabling constraints, which give us freedom and autonomy, autonomy to move within a certain range of guardrails. 
So that's the type of thing we wanted to bring out, that a constraint doesn't just mean we haven't got enough resource to get something done. The book as well, page 188, you talk about prototyping. I was delighted to hear about that because you just talked about bottlenecks and stuff. And a lot of people think, oh, I've got a plumbing problem, and they don't pay attention to whether they're giving the right stuff to the customer. They uh, Hopefully they're checking, but often I find... It, the the however long it takes to get the the product out the door it takes so long that people are just slapping us on the back saying well done well done you got that out the door you got the twenty million in value well done fantastic but actually then a woman rings in the call center and says uh, your app is telling me I don't know how to spell my own name you know those kind of things <laughs> better demand so I'm delighted to see you talking about prototyping because we do need to check in with what the customer wants. But even better, we could weed out some of those bad ideas, right? We could do some discovery. Is that what you meant when you're talking about prototyping? Because I, I think I saw some influences from design thinking in there. Is that uh, is that where you were going, John? Do you, I mean, I can add, but I mean, John, John, yeah, put quite a bit into the into this. Yeah. A, a lot of it comes from the design thinking literature that that we got. But prototypes, we wanted to set that aside, the specific, and focus more on on that itself, but. The thing about prototypes is it's more the parts of the whole. So the prototype needs to be is a part that represents the whole. And if you're thinking about value, then that prototype represents value to the customer. But the prototype also is a good stage within the product state cycle where the customer can actually have, give input. So they see a prototype, is this similar to what you're looking for? Is this something, or is it completely off? So in the long run, if, if, you're, if you're off, you're completely off from what the customer wants, the customer looks at it, well, they can bring you back in and correct it. You can recorrect and redo a prototype that's more in line with what they're thinking, and you can save money in the long run by not going to production. You're just focusing on a prototype. So, but the thing is to remember that it's, it represents, it's a part that represents the whole, and that whole is where the customer has input. You know, I'm going to add to that, John, because just on some of the conversations we're having earlier, when people talk about empiricism and um, we talk about, you know, any of this large-scale agile ways of working in some organizations, and it's important to, to make reference that the flow system isn't an agile framework and it isn't teaching people to be agile. And we talk about agility in the book. We do mention elements of agile because it's sort of one of the major ways of working out there at the moment. But the flow system isn't a framework. It's a system of learning and understanding. So that's a, a, a clear distinction there. But when we talk about prototypes, and, and in the same section, I'm looking at the book for those that are listening, in the same section in the book, we also cover set-based design, which I mentioned a few moments ago, which was something pioneered by Toyota in the development of the Toyota Prius having multiple teams running multiple experiments all in parallel to find the best solution but delaying those decisions to later in the design process so more time could be spent in design before scaling for production because if you're in the type of business where you have to scale and it involves big investment in machinery and materials then you want to delay those decisions to the last responsible moment a phrase extreme programming folks will be familiar with or you know some of the design I'm thinking people maximizing the amount of work not done is the phrase we borrowed from the design thinking folks, the lean UX folks. But a lot of what we do in Scrum nowadays is time box waterfall. It's not rapid experiments and empirical empirical experiments and rapid feedback we are just basically time boxing the work into incremental bits of work which basically becomes time box waterfall ways of working really and truly if you're working in a very agile way we're supposed to be testing hypotheses of things we don't have answers for prototyping is part of those techniques to enable us to do that by producing something the customer can give feedback on or a user or an expert or somebody can give feedback on. But we have to understand that feedback isn't empiricism. That's the way we re react to what the customer thinks of the products we have made or the, the thing we've created. Empiricism is when we have a hunch uh, from some observations and we test the hypothesis through an experiment to see whether our 
our observations and our hunch from that observations was correct. Getting feedback is something different. We're reacting for feedback. So when people get feedback and call it empirical, that's actually an incorrect description of what they're doing. But a lot of scrum that I see out in the world isn't actually doing lots of experiments to prove something we don't have the answer to. It's basically chunking up a project into two week or whatever segments and then delivering it in that way, which is not what we're trying to achieve. In the book, I expected there to be a much bigger section on the OODA loop because I watched the whole series, the OODA loopers, a couple of years ago on YouTube. I think, John, you must have been holding Nigel back there. They were, you had the reins pulled, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> But, uh, to be fair, I'm not the I'm not the guilty party. Our uh, our other colleague and co-creator Brian Rivera Ponch, yeah. because he's the big OODA looper. But look, yeah. I'll leave it at this: the OODA loop is explaining how we make decisions. It's not teaching you how to make decisions. So uh, there's a lot more on that, and there's another book that is planned that will go a lot more into decision making, especially in complexity. OODA loop and variants of the OODA loop will be covered in that and uh, the people that are really fascinated by it can go listen to Brian's podcasts and the things that he writes and talks about with his various guests but it's, it's a way that we understand how we make decisions particularly in a complex environment under stress which is where it came from, fighter aviation but it's not actually teaching you how to make better decisions although some of the proponents of it would like it to be doing that, it's not John, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that No, no, that's good It's, it's So for those who don't know it's observe, orient, decide and act and that's the OODA, OODA loop and it's not linear, it's a cyclical model so you, you can jump in at any stage but it's it's like Nigel said, it's a decision making. It's how we make decisions, and it's really how an individual cognitively processes information. So it's a good model on on that level. But you know, there's some discussion and disagreements. But I I I just leave it at the individual level of analysis. And once you get to the team level of analysis, it OODA loop could be involved, but it it needs something else besides just the OODA loop for, for a team level. And so that kind of would lead into some of the stuff that we talk about in the shared cognitions and developing cognitions conversation. But it, I'll just leave the OODA loop. I see it as more of an individual model and not, not a team model. Thank you, John. Um, mm -hmm. Nigel, in the book I noticed uh, there was a small section on Scrum the Toyota way. Would you mind just giving us the kind of bottom line about how the Toyota way is different. How would you convince people that uh, Scrum the Toyota way is, is different to the, say, Scrum and the Scrum Guide, for example? What would be the main thing? So, it is and it isn't. And so, the, the Scrum the Toyota way was a bit of a, a play on words. When we developed the Scrum training within Toyota, when I was working at Toyota there, we developed it as a way of teaching people who are very familiar with Toyota's production system and lean ways of thinking, how and where Scrum would fit and why it was valuable and why it was useful. And indeed, if you listen to Jeff Sull and Ken Schwabel, they'll tell you a major influence in within the Scrum framework when they designed it was Toyota and the Toyota ways of working. And if anybody familiar looks at PDCA, plan, do, check, act cycle, that's what Scrum is basically with some discipline and some structure and some, debt, well, what we used to call roles now, uh, accountabilities within Scrum around that cycle. So what I was trying to do in Toyota and what I tried to convey in the book, there are certain elements, some foundation and fundamental practices that came from Toyota's way of working, from some of the names we mentioned at the beginning of this broadcast. And, and we needed to, I needed to emphasize and express to these people, they needed to learn some of those fundamental principles of lean. And that it wasn't a matter of lean or scrum. It was a matter of lean and scrum. And the Toyota way is really the behaviors and disciplines of people at Toyota, the f philosophy of Toyota, when applied to the, the mechanics of the Toyota production system. So it was really bringing these together as a symbiosis to explain that scrum had its roots or some of its roots and origins within the Toyota 
production system and the Toyota way of thinking. But by bringing the two together, I was able to show that there was symbiosis and similarity, but that some of those fundamental foundational principles were not being learned and not being understood by a lot of modern day practitioners who, bless them, had gone on a two day course and got a certificate of qualifying them to be some scrum uh, advocate or practitioner. And that's what the thrust of Scrum the Toyota Way was all about. I mean, it was really to dig into those origins and to sort of bring those through. And, and indeed, look, I'll, the one thing we found when we were teaching this at Toyota is that the people who worked in manufacturing just got it. There was no struggle for them, no challenge for them. They just understood it. It all made sense because they were like, but we do this every day, Nigel. So all I was really doing was adding in the, the nuances of Scrum, the, the roles and the sort of events and the artifacts to give them a structured way of doing what they already understood as PDCA. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. In part three, you got distributed leadership. And there's, there's a lot of tiles there. You're using, I noticed as well, by the way, you're using hexagon tiles. I think you've got some hexi kits, is that right? You've got some, I believe you can buy a kit and, and the uh, the flow system hexes will be there and you can lay them out. Uh, is, is that something that's already uh, happening, Nigel? So, right. So first of all, they are hexes or hexagons. The reason for that is due to something called tessellation. They all fit together in any direction equally. So it's just the, the, the best shape for the patterns that we, and it's a regular polygon. That's the, the type of hexagon we've chosen. So uh, Dave Snowden's company, the Canavan company have developed this technique, this tool. They have a base kit. There's a new version of it coming out very shortly, which you can buy. But all the hexes from the flow system are available free of charge to download and make your own from the same website. The website's referenced in the book, and then just Google it, and it'll Google will bring them to it. And essentially, we wanted to make all the knowledge, the worksheets you mentioned briefly earlier, there's 41 of them, and also the, the various hexes that help people explore these techniques and these environments. And John, for the people watching, is holding one up for the people listening. Go watch the video version of the podcast. But essentially, we wanted to make them available to everybody because there are people in many parts of the world that $100 is a lot of money. And if you, um, I don't know what these kits are going to cost, but let's just assume that $20, $30 could be a week's wages for somebody. So we wanted to make the assets available to anybody globally so they can download them, print them, cut them out, and you make, have some utility from them. But yes, proper kits will be available, including a kit from scrum.org as well for PSTs and, and, and PSX holders out there. And they should be available very, very soon. In fact, there's a podcast uh, early April with scrum.org that myself and Dave Snowden will be doing to talk about Hexi in greater detail. I want to drill into on distributed leadership. It's a big part of the book, distributed leadership. And one I wanted to zone in on first was... On page 290, shared mental models. And I'd like to understand where you were going with this. How is this relevant to distributed leadership? Why, why is it important? Uh, why was this a, a section that needed to be in the book on, on say, page 290? <clears throat> All John Turner's. <laughs> well, it, it goes to our concept of what leadership is. And that, that kind of more in the introduction that we talk about it. So when you talk about leader, you're talking about an individual. And so there's a lot of leadership theories that touch, touch on the traits, behaviors, skills of leaders. And then they also talk about interaction between a leader and the follower, leader, follower, dyads and exchanges. And that's leadership mostly at the individual level. And that's like, 50 plus years of research that that's where they're at but leadership is shifting its focus it's it's moving away from the individual and moving more towards collective leadership and so we distinguish leader being the individual and we look at leadership as being a collective construct yeah and that's where distributed leadership comes into play it's a collective construct so when you're dealing with complexity no one because it's too complex no one person has all the knowledge, skills, or experience 
because they have never they didn't see this type of problem before. They don't have the knowledge because it's it's coming at different variables. The variables are changing at different rates, so you need a lot of different people to come in with different knowledge. So that's where the requisite variety comes into play. You need a lot of people coming in to look at the problem, and so this that's where shared cognition because you're working with a group or a team. To, to understand complexity, you have to develop shared mental models. And leaders need to understand what that is and how to train their teams or let their teams develop these shared mental models. And so that's why the shared mental models is, is in the, the leadership section, the distributed leadership, because it leadership is more collective. And for the collective, the leaders in that group or team need to develop shared mental models, a shared understanding of, of what's going on. You know, Thank you, John. I, I can see some techniques here as well, page 293. You've got stability of membership, so people kind of working together for a reasonable period of time so they get to understand how each other work, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then you've got training. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a good one to get people started. Then meta communication. So there's communication about the process of communication. So you're saying here it forces members to discuss how, when, and, and through what medium communication will take place. It kind of reminds me of the team APIs from team topologies where teams will kind of define how they want to be communicated with and how they want to communicate with others kind of thing. And then you mentioned psychological safety, which you mentioned earlier, about creating a constructive climate where that can happen. But uh, good to see you also using the word climate as the word I refer to as well, not just the culture, but what's the climate right. as well. And then, of course, tools. Like You talk about virtual right boards, but I, I guess, are you kind of hinting at obey boards there as well? What uh, what kind of uh, visualization do you have in mind there? Well, so, uh, just, just to add, I mean... <laughs> People need to understand the concept of an obeyer from a lean perspective. Obeyer just means big room. That's all it really means. And, and that doesn't mean the big room planning in scaled agile or something of that nature. It just means big room. But the idea is, from a Toyota perspective, is all the assets, all the knowledge, everything necessary for the team or teams to work effectively on the product is available and visual at any time, at any point, in the obeyer now of course now we move into this more hybrid way of working we've worked across borders for many years there's the concept of a digital obeyer and there are products out there that, that facilitate that that's different than a mural board or a miro board which could be used for the same purpose but the idea is of an uh, more of a, an obeyer is more interactive it's not just static there's other information there and so the boards have some level of intelligence and some of the products i'm looking at allow you to have all sorts of connectivity to all the external sources of information and bring that forward and visualize it in a in a highly visual way whereas mural and miro tend to be more static there may be some plugins potentially but we're when we talk about developing a shared mental model we're bringing together assets and john will add some in this but assets and other things that may help us get on the same page get some consensus get some agreement I just wanted to add one thing. This is different to the sort of often the, the word mindset that a lot of people use, that misuse and use all the time. Now, a mindset, I prefer the word attitude. I've had a lot of debates with people in the industry about this idea of mindsets. And as John alluded to when we were talking about the OODA loop earlier, and you see how all these things are interconnected now, the interplay here. But the, the when he was alluding to the fact that you know, individuals versus collectives. An individual can have a mindset. Their worldview is how it's described with the word Voltenschau. I'm going to apologize to all the German listeners for mispronouncing and butchering that. But the worldview, it's your worldview, your inputs. And even the Uda Loop talks about this, your nature, your nurture, your cultural background, the things, your growth, and all the inputs you've got that determine your worldview on everything that you see and hear and believe. And that is influenced by everything you hear and see every day, scrolling through TikTok, etc. Whereas a shared mental model is not that. A shared mental model is where you get a collective understanding and a shared understanding of something that you can potentially align to, be it a strategy, a direction of travel, etc. I invite John Turner to add some additional colour to that that's probably more scientific than my description. No, that's good. So I, I use concept maps a lot with students in, in research 
they develop a concept map. But when I do the team ac activities, I use the mural boards, but you could use Muri as well. But what the mural board does, or these open whiteboards, is you allow the team members to come together, that you go through the convergence, divergent processes, their thinking, coming together, and you're starting to sh build a shared understanding. And that's where it's coming in, the shared mental models. And so when you're talking about shared mental models, you're looking at the shared understanding. All members have the same under similar understanding of what the goal is, what the problem is. But then they also have an accurate understanding of what the goal is and what the problem is, right? So they're all coming together with the same goal and objective. Yeah. yeah. But that's really cool. I really like that. Uh, it kind of ties in with some of the team science stuff that we're going to get onto mm -hmm. very soon as well, because part four of the book, and by the way, the book really kind of, for people kind of listening to this, uh, the book really lit up for me from page 434 onwards in terms of, I saw some new stuff I hadn't seen before. Uh, all right. I saw a fresh perspective. I, there was lots of very interesting stuff as well right up to this, by the way, because that's why we've been talking about it for so long. But for the casual reader, if you're thinking, oh, I've read the first 300 pages and I don't want to read any more, please read at the end of the book because there's a lot of juicy stuff right up to the very end, actually. It really comes to life in the team science bit. And uh, I wanted to kind of drill into this a little bit, John, because I think this was uh, you were kind of involved in this piece the most. And there were three topics in particular in there. There's loads of juice in there. You could nerd out on this for another two hours. But there's three topics in particular. The first one I want to talk about is situational awareness in the team science bit. Why did you feel it was so important to have that topic in the book, John? Oh, sorry, uh, if you were looking for pages 495. Yeah, no, I get it. Well, on team science, situational awareness really was uh, Nigel's inclusion, right? Ah, okay. Oh, Sorry. Oh, he, he introduced it. Yeah, so, so it's not 100% one or the other, so there, there's mixes and matches. So Nigel really brought in the situational analysis on, on team science. I'll, I'll just jump in there for, yeah. for John's benefit on that. And he's, he's correct. This book... The first book was a lot of deep work by John. This book became much more collaborative as I started to add some of my flavor and color in there. But situational awareness also comes from a lot of the work that Brian Rivera does, Ponch does, because when you talk about pilots, you talk about fighter aviation or even civil aviation, situational awareness is incredibly important. And there's actually a, a description of a real event that happened in the 70s when an aircraft crashed into the Florida Everglades due to a lack of situational awareness. But if we talk about it in the terms of teams doing work in organizations, we talk about sense making. We've already described that. We talked a little bit about weak signal detection, detect, you know, knowing things before you need to know them, detecting the patterns, the signals in the ether, the dark constraints, and starting to make sense of them. But situational awareness is literally being aware of everything that's happening around you in all instances from all sources, no matter how small or how insignificant, so that you are prepared for an event or an eventuality or something that occurs. We see so many people walking in parks and walking down streets with earphones in iPods, uh, you know, the iPod earphones in the things of that nature and not listening to anything around them. And untoward things happen. They step out in front of traffic because they're reading the text messages or looking at TikTok with, the, with their earpods in, walking down the street. They've got music blaring, their attention is distracted on the phone. And that's a lack or a loss of situational awareness. And, you know, bad things can happen or, you know, un unforeseen consequences. It's like texting and driving. You're losing situational awareness of the road, of everything around you. You may get lucky and be able to react quickly. Now, in a business context, if you lose situational awareness, you lose sight of what the competition are doing. Now, I work with some venture capitalists, and they use a lot of the, the teachings up from complexity thinking and complexity theory to actually start to outpace of their competitors. They're looking for the weaknesses in the big corporations, the big companies, and they're looking to act actively exploit 
those weaknesses. So they're using sense making and weak signal detection and a great level of situational awareness because they're looking for opportunities to exploit the incumbents, the big players out there. And so by developing a level of situational awareness so that everybody in your organization understands what's happening, what's moving all around them, what the competition are doing, what the markets are doing, what the customers are doing, how the economy and politics are affecting what we do as a business, different levels in different contexts, of course. But this is what we mean by developing a level of situational awareness and just simply in a team. What are your teammates doing? Are you finding out at daily scrum, daily stand-up, what they've been doing for the last 24 hours? Or are you fully aware of everything that's happening? Are you communicating, collaborating, and, and being part of that team unit and maintaining a level of situational awareness so that you don't make mistakes, you don't go off in the wrong direction, accidents don't occur, mistakes don't occur, and you maintain and sustain things like quality and effectiveness of the products and services you're working on. So this is all about about developing, and one of the other sections, developing cognitions. It's part of that as well. Developing the knowledge, the capabilities of the individuals within the team to enable them. So situational awareness could be seen as one of those things we will develop in individuals in a team to make better team performance. I'll just add, so it's, it's required for sense making. We talked about sense making earlier. You need to be aware of your environment and the conditions and what's changing. So you really need a high level of situational awareness and complexity. And then compared to predictable domain where, where you have the inputs and you have the predicted outcomes that you're expecting, that, that you don't really need the situational awareness there. Just you're looking at variance, variability in the outcomes to see and then make the right corrections to get to the outcome. But again, when you're in the complex domain, you don't have the predictability. And now you, what you would traditionally ignore the outliers, now you have to pay attention to those outliers because those outliers could emerge into something that's really making a large impact on on what you're doing or they may be minimal but but you have to start looking at outliers and things that you wouldn't normally look at when you're in the predictable domain you know i know we we're spending a bit of time on this but the other thing we cover a lot in the book and this is really relevant for the age of artificial intelligence now is automation bias so this is one of the elements where we trust the machines or we become less aware of our environment and our situational awareness because the machine is doing the work. And as AI starts to do more and more of this and we move from sort of, you know, simple automation, simple yes, no, pass, fail type responses from a machine into where the machine is seemingly making decisions and thinking like a person, we start to rely more and more on the automation and we get a loss of situational awareness. And that's when we described the incident in the Everglades where they were so obsessed with a warning light having burnt out, a bulb had failed, that they were so obsessed with that that they disconnected the autopilot without even realizing they disconnected it and they flew from several thousand feet directly into the ground and killed everybody on board and that was a lack of situational awareness caused by automation bias because they assumed the machine was flying the plane and nobody bothered to check and it is a worry with ai and kind of wondering I think the temptation for lots of organizations will be to to get efficient cut costs. Uh, but actually, I th uh, the way I, AI looks at the moment to me, it's almost like we need AI. Uh, while, while we have prompt engineers, we all they, they also need to be um, almost like auditing the responses because it's not there yet. The technology isn't there yet, at least in my opinion. It's uh, not for uh, really tricky decisions that we need to make. Which uh, brings us on to a very interesting, fascinating topic that I hear about a lot, which is red teaming. So red teaming is uh, where essentially you're you're challenging, you're, you're allowing people to be open to some kind of dissent in the ideas. I think ritual dissent, I think, would be a, kind of an example from uh, Dave Snowden's work where you, you're kind of giving pe people permission to kind of go crazy and criticize ideas. And this is something I don't see enough of, quite frankly. I see a lot of groupthink. I see people watching the optics and being careful about what they're saying and an absence of good leadership, a good leader, you know, speaking last, you know, letting everybody speak and then just, uh, you know, then let, uh, let the things emerge. So I'm delighted that you brought this into the book. 
because I'm seeing this from other thought leaders as well, talking about red teaming. What was it uh, that was so important for you about including this in, in the book? Well, this came from Brian Rivera from his military background, red teaming. And it's, it's really a critical analysis of the team from someone outside of the team. And that's essentially what red teaming is. So there's a whole bunch of different methods within the red teaming paradigm that, that you can pull from. We just provided a couple examples in the book. But being critical of the team, a critical analysis. But, again, that's you can't just do red teaming unless, you know, you have a team, unless the team members are trained to work together and the team has a level of psychological safety because you need to be able to criticize one another without feeling fear of retribution, and that's that's required. So the, so the teams have to have some level of evolution and development before you can go right into critical analysis or red teaming. So it all kind of ties together, but if you just go into a new team and, and practice red teaming and, and critical analysis – then they they won't take it very well, right? And then they'll that'll introduce conflict within the team, and they'll start pointing fingers. But you really have to have developed teams first before you can bring in the the red teaming techniques. I think just to add to what John is saying, and, and he's right, Ponch did introduce this because of his deep military background, and in fact, red teaming was developed by the, the military, that's where it comes out of. But ask yourselves this, if you're in a team and you're making a plan, maybe a sprint plan for the next sprint, think about inviting somebody, and especially if there's a bunch of assumptions or a bunch of vagueness or, or things that are you know a little ambiguous in there, um, invite other people in who have nothing to do with the work you do doing nothing to do with the plan you've created they may understand the context a little invite them in to have you walk through the plan and explain it and uh, get them to ask questions probing questions give feedback even critical feedback and and as you mentioned there's things like ritual descent which gets into a whole different level of psychological safety but the idea of red teaming is somebody who didn't make the plan didn't make the decisions examines the decisions examines the plan that's been made and finds problems with it. Now, the military use it to ensure the success of military campaigns. And then there are other techniques that Dave Snowden talks about, entangled trios. We don't cover that in the book. People can find that on his his own website, where we take people from very diverse parts of the organization and bring them together to look at a problem because we want that diversity of opinion. Well, the similar type of focus here, we want that diversity of opinion and those those thoughts and those observations from somebody who's not uh, immersed in the context so much that they miss the things in their periphery, that inattentional blindness we also describe in the book. See, there's so much of this that intertwines and interconnects for people to be able to understand it, hence the triple helix. But that's the basic concept of red teaming. Have people challenge the decisions and assumptions and planning you've made to make sure it's a solid plan that is more likely to be successful. Thank you, Nigel. And earlier in the book as well, at the very start of the book, you talked about value flowing horizontally. And in the distributed leisure part, I saw a bit about value stream mapping. Very interested in your take on value stream mapping for knowledge work because it's commonly used in in Toyota, for example, but uh, how is it used in knowledge work? But also the book closes with the whole topic of multi-team systems. So I guess you're going to have a value stream map across multiple teams there's something you say very interesting in the book which is that basically it was about goals it was a a multi-team system is distinguished by goals so you're giving people a direction to go in this is where we're going this is where it's difficult actually with these silos you do have a value stream i remember i had a client two years ago and each then that they're all taught the execs were all talking about collaboration at an exec level it was just lip service because it was cues in between the departments each or each each, it was like an, an empire on its own, each organization. So one was about new ideas. The other part was kind of keep the factories open, keep them running. You know, so like surprise, surprise when the innovations land in the factories, like, yeah, we'll wait for a test window. Like when's that going to happen kind of thing? So th- I've said a lot there, but basically the whole idea of value flowing across multiple teams, probably across multiple departments, going towards maybe one direction, 
What's your view on this and how does the flow system help organizations to get this going? I'll, I'll cover a bit, then I'll let John talk about MTS because that really is his deep, deep, deep sweet spot and, and, and most of those sections that he's the, the sort of expert in there. But you just mentioned about executives playing lip service. Now there's a lack of a shared mental model, you see. So already you're starting to see how this, this interplays in there. So, yeah, value stream mapping came out of Toyota. It was known as materials and information flow analysis and, in fact, is still known as that. The value stream mapping came from John Shook and Mike Rother when they wrote the book Learning to See and they coined that phrase. And it's a perfectly good phrase. It comes in for a lot of flack with different people, lots of critics out there. But if you just imagine you want to make sense, so forget value stream mapping is a, a phrase for now, and you just want to use sense making. You want to make sense of how you create the value you create. So I mentioned earlier, I often have, ask executives, what's the problem you think you're trying to solve? And then the next question I ask them is, how do you do what you do? Do you actually know how you do what you do? So those executives up there paying lip service, they have no clue of how the work gets done. So unless you understand how the work gets done, how are you going to improve how the work gets done to enable greater flow, lower costs, better customer reception and various other factors you may measure yourself on? ENPS is the favorite one out there. Um, so how are you going to do that if you don't understand how you do what you do? So you need to make sense of your organization. And in a complex uh, context, we can use narrative, storytelling, sense making, different types of techniques that are out there but when we get into but even in the the ordered world or even in that transitional that liminal boundary between ordered and less ordered or less predictable we can map how work gets done visually we can visually draw the way work gets done so you're starting to map the processes. However, the bit that distinguishes a process map from a value stream map is the information flows. So typically in an organization, process flows left to right, start to finish. But information flows from finish to start. So the information is the feedback mechanisms. Now, some of that information may be update the ERP system, update accounting, update this, send this email, notify these people. But then there's other information that's flowing back, which is that continuous feedback mechanism through the work that you are doing. Now, as you start, and you mentioned constraints, bottlenecks and other constraints in the organization. Well, how do you visualize the constraints? How do you even find them? So there is a way you need to go. I know the theory of constraints folks will have their own way of doing this, but there is always a way where you have to find the constraints and then make them visible. So value stream mapping is just a technique for doing that. Uh, it originated in Toyota, which is a very linear sort of process way of, of doing work. But even in a complex environment, you still need to identify constraints. You still need to identify things in the system that are adversely affecting the performance of the system, and you need to make those visible. So I get, don't want people to get hung up on the words or the title of value stream mapping other than to understand what we're trying to do is understand how the system works, how it produces the value, and to make that visible. And even in... Even in organizations people describe as complex, and, and Dave Stone's debated this statement with me many, many, many times, I, I use this statement as a proposition that all organizational complexity is human-derived. So if you remove the humans from the system, all the problems are no longer complex. We add the complexity. So if you imagine that what you're trying to do is, in a system, the majority of the system isn't actually complex. The work we're doing, the processes, the techniques we're using aren't actually complex. We're trying to map how that gets done, make it visible. We introduce co complexity with our attitudes, our behaviors, our incentives, our focus, and various other things, and our political and other persuasions which cause stress and arguments and debate and discussion. So a lot of the stuff we talk about in team science is how to solve that, 
so that we can actually, we don't, what we don't want, and even Dave Snowden, I'm sure, would say this, we don't actually want systems that are complex or even worse, chaotic. We don't want that. We want systems that are simple, that are ordered, that are linear, that are predictable, because that's how we can standardize and we can reduce costs and we can actually deliver a continuous flow of value and a predictable service. So we're always trying to pull things out of complexity, but by recognizing it and having different tools to work in complexity and to remove as much of that complexity as possible. Value stream mapping is just one of many techniques I might use to help me understand the process. John, you're the MTS expert. So MTS, multi-team systems is really where everything has to come together in order to achieve successful multi-team systems within an organization. So the last 20 or 30 years, organizations have really shifted to team-based structures. So they're doing a lot and some literature is even saying the fundamental learning unit within organizations today are teams. That's how predominant they've, they've become. But in the same scope that you can't just throw people together and call them a team, you can't just throw teams together and call it a multi-team system, right? It'll never work. And so there's other terms like teams of teams or scale teams that are similar to what multi-team system looks at. But from the team science field, a discipline they they focus on multi team systems and there's this research that supports the structure and, and what we present in the multi team system literature. So a multi team system is two or more teams working towards a common goal. So you, you talked about goals. Within the structure of a multi team system, each team has their own team goal, which is, is called a proximal goal. It's close to them. And each each team's proximal goal contributes to the larger multi-team system yeah. goal, which is the distal goal. So that's your goal alignment within the teams and the multi-team system. So those two or three or four teams that are within that multi-team system, each team has, they could have the same proximal goal or different proximal goals, but each of those proximal goals contribute to the multi-team system goal. So, so that's that's one, one of the defining features of a multi-team system. And then one of the issues we identified with organizations going to team-based structures is that they go into team-based structures, but they don't change the leadership structure. So the teams are maybe working well, but they're not being supported. So the outcomes are, or products are, are lacking, right? So you have to change the leadership structure. So within the multi-team system, we, we had the, a functional leader to the multi-team system. So we talked earlier about leaders being individual, being leader to follower focused. The functional leader is a leader to team focus and not leader to follower. So the functional leader would coordinate the activities. So if you had three teams within a multi-team system, functional leader would coordinate the activities between each team within that multi-team system and they would make sure that the goals are aligned with the multi-team system. And then they would provide resources to the teams when they need it, shared resources. And that's kind of the function of the, the functional leader is to support the teams and to make sure the goals are aligned to meet the organizational level. So that's a level of leadership that we include in with the multi-team systems to help make it work. I think the important thing to, to mention there, just, just for the benefit here, is that when you get into a multi-team system, leaders are supporting the teams in a multi-team system. Now, there's lots of words for this, you know, tribes and, you know, all sorts of other scaling terms that people have used out there. The literature calls it a multi-team system, hence the reason we use that, that language. But... We're moving into, when we talk about distributed leadership, and here's some of the linkage here, we are empowering people. We're giving them autonomy within any enabling constraints, those guardrails, to move freely with autonomy and to make decisions in a psychologically safe environment, safe to fail environment, so they don't fear repercussion or, or, or come back on them if something doesn't work quite well. And leadership in a multi-team system is an enabling capability, not a directing and telling capability. It's an enabling, enabling capability. 
there's always discipline and supervisory levels of control needed in any system to stop you know the lunatics running the asylum to prevent chaos but at the same time we want to enable people not control people and these are some of the nuances that people talk about in leadership and leaders say oh yes yes i enable i empower my people but what they don't they, what they tend to do is to delegate and then to overrule or, 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 or counterman when they're not happy with the decisions that are being made. And so there are some nuances. This is a huge field that will take another whole podcast to cover. But these are some of the basic nuances when we start to get. And this is why scaling in any organization, whether it's agile or otherwise, organizational change, organizational design, which are huge fields. And you mentioned Matthew's book, Team Topologies, earlier and stuff, and Manuel as well, just to throw them both in there. But the, this is an area where people need to spend a lot of time and start to think about why they're designing a system the way they are. And before they even get into organizational design, before they even get into multi-team systems and scaling they need to go and clarify the problem which is why it's at the beginning of the book and multi-team systems are at the end of the book after we've gone through all these behaviors and organizational design and value stream mapping and because it gets them to the point okay we now understand what it is we're trying to do now we understand how to do it and how and the, and the various different mechanisms we need to bring this together and that's a really important thing because people rush into scale and if you scale a pile of something you'll end up with a big pile of something i read lots of books as you're probably aware i have to research uh, for when i'm interviewing guests but I'm, i read anyway i'm just like a, I read a lot of books every single week and i really enjoy this one and i read quite fast uh, even for a speed reader it can take four to five hours to get through this like i really got you know and uh took me quite a bit to a couple to a couple of sittings but i really enjoyed it and like i said be patient readers uh around 400 and odd it, it starts coming to life again and it, it is full of life but there's lots of fresh stuff towards the back of the book so it's worth going through the whole thing and reading it cover to cover question for you gentlemen who is this targeted at so who would be your ideal customers actually using the flow system Go on, John. I'll let you answer. For, I have an opinion. I'm just going to let John tell you because we come from different worlds. Yeah. And so he's, he's using it in a, some different context than I, John. Yeah. Well, in, in higher education, we're, we're building it. So we have the worksheets in here. And so we have a course, graduate level, which is called organization development. And organization development looks at solving known problems right and how to how to different methods and techniques for solving known problems but the one thing they don't address is is complex problems so we're kind of some of the courses in od is we're, what we're doing is bringing some of these methods into the curriculum into courses of od and on how to deal with complexity because that's one area where od doesn't operate uh, another area is so that at our university they just started a Doctor of Business Administration, and within that program, there's a course called Managing Complexity, and I'll be teaching that course next year, or I'm, I should be, we're still in conversations, but the Flow System Playbook is going to be one of the primary books for that course, and by using the taxis and using the book, they'll go through each of the different helixes and the methods within the helixes and then start to work through solving a problem using the methods from not only the flow system, but we'll also bring in the helixes from uh, Kinevin Framework, Kinevin Company. And then if there are other helixes, we'll try to bring them into the, the curriculum so that they have all these different methods so they can learn about all these different methods as part of the, the curriculum in the course. Lovely. I'll add just my two cents on that. So we designed the book not as a reading book, but I admire you, John, for reading it cover to cover. Fantastic. There is a little bit of a tip here. It, look, the flow system was always designed or always conceived as a way to teach people to help them understand, to learn, to develop their abilities, not as a prescription, a recipe, or any form of framework, say, go do this and everything will be fine. Because we know, especially in complexity, which is where the book's focus is, there is no framework, there is no prescription, there is no one-size-fits-all. That's the fallacy of a lot of the frameworks in the agile world. So that, that was first and foremost a focus. 
it really is intended for anybody who is a practitioner or a leader in an organizational context or in a business context that are dealing with complex environments unpredictable non-linear environments even though we cover some of the linearity and predictability to draw control to draw the differences the, the reference between the differences of a complex system and an ordered system it's predominantly aimed at people who are working in these complex systems so agile practitioners would fit that straight away and we wanted to do it in a way which enabled them to first of all learn and study and then use it as a reference book my tip for how to read this book, and I thank John, my bit, my partner on this, is really read the preface, read the introduction, read the lean thinking section. That's a linear progression, it's about an hour's worth of commitment. Now read the introduction to the other three core sections, complexity thinking, distributed leadership, team science, in that order. Then read the conclusion. Now go back and dip in in the areas that really intrigue you or really interest you. I help write the book, and it takes me six hours to read it from end to end. When I was doing proofreading, the first time took a lot longer, but the proofreads all took about six hours. You have to remember that 41 of the items in there are worksheets to help you learn the different skills, and those you can download. Don't skip them but realize that's a piece of learning to reinforce what you've just read in the, in the section prior to that. And of course, these endless references. Dave West from Scrum Org, who wrote one of the Fords, he, he sent me a note saying, you know, he, he sort of used some colorful language, which is unusual for Dave West. But he said to me, he says, you know, I hate you. He says, I got lost for two hours following references before I realized what was happening. Because within the book... It forms a body of knowledge which allows you to go off into numerous different directions and follow the scent of something we've introduced. This is not, a be not an end. This is a beginning to your learning and to your studies. And it's a way to guide you through what some people, as you've made reference, John, struggle to understand or don't even know exists out there. So we wanted to introduce all this to give people a way to improve and to focus on the things that are important to them. For having you both on the show. Loved reading your book and I wish you the best of luck with it and looking forward to hearing lots more from the two of you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks, John. Thank you.